any good story usually has a good backstory. <laughs> so let's start with you, Scott. In 1971, you're at Princeton, and you're going to write your senior thesis, and you choose Max. How did that happen? Well, actually, we have to go back a, a little farther. Um, it, when I was a sophomore, I well, I have to go back before that. Okay. I went off. <laughs> let's keep let's, going. Let's start. Let's start when I was 15. When were you born? <laughs> um, yeah. No, we'll work. We're, in high school, I had to do the obligatory author's report. And at my mother's insistence, I wrote about her favorite author, F. Scott Fitzgerald. Uh, and I became so consumed with Scott Fitzgerald that by the time I had graduated from high school, Palisades High School here, uh, I had literally read everything written by or about Scott Fitzgerald, I think, in the English language. And the only school I seriously considered going to was Princeton. I went off to Princeton. I was on campus about two days before I began going through all his papers that were there. And I just kept seeing Max Perkins popping up everywhere. And I thought, who is this guy? I spent a whole day looking up every reference I could find about Perkins, found almost nothing had been written about him. And then I decided, gee, this could be a really interesting book. And I went to Hemingway's biographer, who was teaching at Princeton, a man named Carlos Baker. I mentioned this idea. He said, it's a great idea for a book. The problem is uh, whether you can do this book, uh, since you're now all of 18 and a half, <laughs> and, and you're doing really solid uh, B minus work here. <laughs> um, you might want to think about, well, anyway, he said, why don't you do your senior thesis on this? And if you're still interested, then carry it on and, and, and write, a, write a book. Um, so I graduated June 8th, 1971. I moved into the library June 9th and began transposing what was my senior thesis into a book. And what a book it is. Thank you very much. So John, now we'll fast forward uh -huh. a few years. This book comes across your bow. Now, I've read almost all of Scott's books, and they are dense and rich and full of wonderful characters, incredible things that you would never know if he didn't tell us. He paints these beautiful canvases. So was it die dog or eat the hatchet? How did you start? How did you, when, you, when it came to you, what did you do? Well, I mean, it, it all started for me with Scott's book, which I read um, in the 80s, and it, it just stayed with me. And I thought it, it was, it's a majestic biography, and I, I, I strongly recommend anyone who's remotely interested in the subject of this movie to read Scott's book. Um, it's, it's definitive, it's beautifully <coughs> written, it's just, it's a masterful American biography. And to me, it was a thrilling story of a father and a son, a relationship I just found so compelling that I, it wouldn't let go until I got a chance to, uh, to play with it. Now, Scott, at any time, did you turn to John and say, I hate to see the words go? Uh, I think at no time <laughs> did, did I ever say that. I don't recall. John might remember my saying it uh, better than I would. But I don't, you know, I remember actually something that Max Perkins used to tell his authors who were having books turned into screenplays, uh, especially Hemingway. I remember this came up a couple of times. And he said, no matter what happens, the book doesn't change. Your book is still the book. It's going to be there. That's now, good advice. Now, and in this instance, I had a great safety net in that John and I had known each other for several years. We were very good friends by that time. We trusted each other. Um, and I knew what his intentions were. Um, and basically, I remember the, the one thing I said that relates to your question is read the book one more time, John, and then throw it out. And then write your screenplay. That's what you do. You're the dramatist. I've given you the material. Fall back on it when and if you need it. Right, and, and Scott, you know, because he grew up in a, in a movie-making household, Scott's father's a producer, he's written screenplays, he understands the work of a dramatist is not the work of a historian. And I would, I, would the f I would be the first person to say what you saw tonight was not fact, it was not, it was not history, it's a work of drama. Mm -hmm. And creating drama from fact, which is something I've, I've been lucky enough to do a lot in my career, because I've sought it out, requires a great deal of torquing of history to make drama. Uh, and I've always felt that you could torque history to a certain degree as long as you didn't break it. 
and you behave with good faith throughout, you know, I think that's legitimate. And Scott and I are very close. And the first five years of the 16 years of making this movie, um, the o and it was, it's been 16 years of, since, since I first seduced Scott into letting me buy the rights, you know, after, after just a great deal of, of uh, convincing. You know, Scott and I spent about five years working on the script. And I would go away, I would write a draft, I would hesitantly hand it to Scott, who I adore, but Scott is a scrupulous man. Uh, and we would have these dinners at the old Orso, the sadly lacking, no longer with us Orso, where we would talk through page by page and sometimes line by line, exactly like Max Perkins and Thomas Wolfe, for five years until I felt I had made a work of drama that I wanted to stand behind. And Scott, I believe you would say, was involved in a work of drama you felt fairly represented the characters. I, I would just jump in to say two things. The first is, this isn't a documentary. Right. Um, this is a feature film, and that's what John intended to do. Um, and uh, the second thing I would say is, I can't think of an instance really where it violates the book. Uh, John has really stuck very close to the facts of these lives, and certainly the spirit of the lives. That, that there's never a question about. And the only, the only times I think there are any slight deviations, uh, I think only enhance the story to make it work better up on the big screen. I want to talk about the sequence in the film where Max edits Tom's writing on falling in love. Mm -hmm. That sequence to me is so amazing. It's, it's what the film is about. I mean, it starts off very quiet in Max's office, and Max reads all the words to Tom. And then it ends on the railway platform with Tom reading just the right words to the father figure. It's foreshadowing. He gets on the train and he goes away, but he leaves him enlightened and he leaves him more educated. And that the idea of showing the audience what it's like to write, to edit, to collaborate, to create, to fight, all of that was so brilliant. And I just, I, I just wanted to know if... Did you feel like you needed this sort of centerpiece? Did you did you try to show people what it's like to write and edit? Yeah, that that was a, that was the last thing that came into the screenplay, oh. knowing that I needed that piece. And Scott and I talked a lot about there was something so inherently uncinematic about writing right. and editing. And you know, we were able to you know we always pursued and we talked about it. Um, our passion for writing, because people say to me, well, that's kind of a boring job. I'm like, that's my job. I, I find <laughs> pencils going through words to be thrilling. Yeah. I find when you change a semicolon to a colon, my heart stops. <laughs> right. So to me, <laughs> it was always exciting, yeah. you know, every part of it. Yeah. Um, but I felt we had to show that to the audience. We had to share our enthusiasm for pounding keys and scratching words out and make it a dance between these two characters, make it erotic, make it exciting, make it thrilling. So I resisted writing that for almost 14 years. And then I finally said, all right, it's time to write this, this centerpiece uh, sequence. And I'm wow. glad I did. Uh, I would like to know what you think about, um, let's see, it was, Max only outlived Tom by about nine years. So do you think that as Mrs. Bernstein prophesized, there was a great hush in his life after Tom passed? Oh, there's no question there was a great hush in his life. Um, I mean, it was a, a terrible, terrible blow for, for uh, Perkins. Uh, and then, and, and a sad thing that happened, and it was very rough on Perkins, is that before Wolf left or as he left Perkins and then took that trip around the country where he sees Scott Fitzgerald in Hollywood, uh, he had signed a contract with another publishing house, with Harper's. So they had a contract on all the words that remained back in New York. Perkins was about the only one who could read the handwriting on a lot of it uh, and was the only one who knew where all the pieces fit. Mm -hmm. So these new crates came into Perkins' office who had to sit and edit these final two books, The Web and the Rock and You Can't Go Home Again, and then he had to hand them over to the man to at publisher. Harper's, at, to Edward Aswell. So that was just a real body blow too, which he did just for, for Wolf's sake. Then what happens, the hush gets deeper, bigger, wider, and wider in that two years after Wolf dies, F. Scott Fitzgerald dies at 44 years of age. A few years after that, Ring Lardner dies. Um, Hemingway doesn't die, but his career really nosedives. And I remember one day while I was researching the book, I made a list of all Perkins's or his 50 major authors, and 24 of them, all younger than he, predeceased him. Mm. 
So what is that like for this man to adopt all the, mostly men, uh, these young sons, to see all his boys die before him? It was a killer. And he became, in fact, rather alcoholic in the end himself. Oh, God. Yeah, Very sad. Well, I think we should give Max the last word and say well done to both of you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you.